Hello, everyone, and welcome to Blogging Theology. Today, I'm delighted to welcome back uh, Dr. Louis Fatoui, an author and researcher in Islamic studies and comparative religion. You are most welcome, sir. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, I'm honored to be back on your fantastic channel. Well, it's very kind of you. Fantastic to have you back. Now, for those who don't know, uh, Louis is originally from Baghdad in Iraq. Uh, he reverted from Christianity to Islam in his early 20s. He has a PhD from Durham University here in the UK. He has published extensively on Islamic studies and is particularly interested in comparing historical accounts in the Quran with their counterparts in Jewish, Christian and other sources. He is also interested in comparative Abrahamic religions in general, tafsir, chronic exegesis, the historical Jesus and Sufism. And today um, he's kindly agreed to discuss what he calls a Quranic historical miracle, a Quranic historical miracle, a detailed discussion of an amazing subtlety in the Quran involving information about ancient Egypt that became known only in the last century and a half. When Moses told Pharaoh that Allah wanted him to let the Israelites leave Egypt with them, Pharaoh rejected the demand. But then the Quran reports an intriguing claim that Pharaoh and his courtiers made about why Moses wanted to take the Israelites out of Egypt. They claim that Moses wants to lead his people out of Egypt in order to, quote, expel the Egyptians from their land. This baffling claim, which is not found in the Bible, can be understood only by knowing certain episodes in the history of ancient Egypt. Yet this information was unknown until the last one and a half centuries. So Muhammad, upon whom be peace, could not have known about it. So that, I think, is your essential thesis or hypothesis. So over to you, sir. Thank you very much. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala ahli wa sahbihi wa sallam taslima. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa salam. This, um, you obviously described pretty accurately what we're going to talk about today. Um, this, um, the, the history of this research really goes back to about a quarter of a century. Uh, in a book on the Exodus, my wife, Shada Dal Ghazali, and myself published at the time. The... Uh, recently, actually, uh, I did also on my uh, new YouTube channel a video on that. But what I'm going to do today, I'm going to go well beyond what I presented the other day and give a lot more detail, uh, a lot more details and also more arguments. So if anybody has seen that video, uh, please um, stay around because this is more detailed uh, and more informative. Okay. Now, um, as you said, Paul, this is kind of a quite a subtle issue in, in the Quran. It's not uh, like other kind of clear miracles. And um, the, the Quran doesn't make a point about it. It just mentions it. But this is actually quite common in the Quran. Um, something is mentioned and then uh, you study it and you find something um, quite amazing about it as if the Quran is indifferent in some way, uh, trying not to say much about itself and leaving it to us mm. to discover things about it. It's one of the beautiful things, mm. uh, the way uh, the Quran speaks to us in real time, all the time. Because it's a, it's a subtlety, um, I will need um, to deal with um, historical information and quite a bit of textual analysis. I've prepared slides for those. The slides are text heavy, uh, but I will make every effort possible to explain everything as clearly as I can. There's a possibility, Paul, that in the course of me trying to present the material, uh, I would sound a bit vague and clear at times. Please stop me. Um, mm. and let me know so I can make sure that what I'm okay. saying is making sense to everybody is not something I'm just just lives in my brain okay we'll do. Um, okay good now the first thing is um, when we study anything in the Quran in particular when it relates to biblical figures mm. it's always useful to start with it with a comparison see what um, the Jewish or Christian uh, scriptures uh, say 
and mm -hmm. then compare that with the Quran. Um, often people who who aren't Muslims and who don't share our faith, or maybe I would say don't want to look at the Quran uh, in its own terms and fairly, focus only on what the what the similarities that exist between the Quran and other scriptures. And they ignore, minimize, trivialize the differences between the two, when in fact uh, those differences uh, are uh, very significant. Um, a lot of people in the past, and I'm pretty sure, I don't think whether I spoke about it in my uh, presentation on the Exodus, maybe I didn't, but a lot of people who have spoken about this probably on your channel, uh, about things like the difference between uh, the term king uh, or Malik and Fir'aun, Pharaoh, in the stories uh, of uh, uh, Joseph and Moses, uh, alayhim mm -hmm. uh, And the Quran makes this kind of subtle distinction, uh, which wasn't, the purpose of which was not known, and which the um, uh, Bible misses altogether, uh, using both terms ex ex in interchangeably in both stories. Um, in the discussion we had about the Exodus at the time, I discussed a different kind of claim. Uh, again, it's a kind of subtle, really, uh, where uh, I highlighted the fact that the Quran talks about one Pharaoh. And because it's one Pharaoh, it gives us an, a, a way of identifying that Pharaoh. Now, these are the kind of differences. As you can see, they, they, they may look kind of small and short textually, but they're actually quite rich, uh, kind of rich in information mm -hmm. and tell us quite a lot about the Quran. So this is why we as Muslims, while we study other scriptures and st study the similarities, we also give uh, sufficient and enough and equal significance to any differences between the different scriptures. And that's what we're going to look at today. So starting um, with the Bible, I uh, will, uh, yeah, thank you, Paul. So uh -huh. is it showing, Paul, on your screen? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Right so this is the biblical account uh, that's really relevant, if you like, really remotely to what we're talking about. I'm going to read it out for those who are following on their mobile phones or can't see the screen. Uh, afterwards, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, Thus says the Lord, the Lord, the God of Israel, let my people go so that they may celebrate a festival to me in the wilderness. But Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should heed him and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord and I will not let Israel go. Then they said, the God of the Hebrews has revealed himself to us. Let us go a three days journey into the wilderness to sacrifice to the Lord our, to, to our, to the Lord our God, or he will fall upon us with pestilence or sword. But the king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why are you taking the people away from their work? Get to your labors. Now, this is, um, let me just probably um, remove it for now. Mm. Um, so the main point um, to take away from this passage is that um, the, the, the Pharaoh did not want, the, all that he understood is that uh, uh, Moses and Aaron were going to take uh, the Israelites temporarily out of Egypt, because actually, in the Bible, and this comes from the Exodus, uh, the account Moses was not really totally honest with Pharaoh. <laughs> this is true. It's quite striking. When I first read that, I thought, hang on, this is not being quite straight with the facts. Yeah, but It wasn't. Sorry. And it's actually it's repeated more than once also throughout the story. So it's not like it was a one-off. No, he was a quite insistent or that according to the writer mm. uh, of the Exodus. Uh, so uh, because the Israelites were slaves at the time, doing a lot of labor, uh, for Pharaoh, building, etc. Um, he his argument was: if you're going to take the Israelites away to worship in the wilderness for whatever period of time, few days, uh, then you're, I'm going to lose labor. Basically, that's his argument. That's the main point um, that he was arguing about. That, of course, uh, is very different uh, from what we have in the Quran. Now, I am not aware 
uh, of other Jewish sources uh, other than the apocryphal book of Jubilees. And this is a, a book that comes from around 100 BCE. It contains an account mm. of, uh, of Genesis and the Exodus uh, written in the, so addressing Moses. So it's in the second person. And this is supposedly the angels speaking, speaking to Moses alayhi salam, who then on the Mount, Mount Sinai, who then wrote this down and brought it with him. The account um, we're interested in uh, covers only the last five chapters of the 50 um, chapters of, of Jubilees. And it doesn't have anything relevant to what we're talking about. So the point I'm trying to make here, I am not aware of, because at times people look for references, similar references to what is mentioned in the Quran, not necessarily in the Bible, but in other sources. I am not aware of any such reference. So we know what the Bible says. So we move now uh, to the to the Quran. Um, maybe not exactly yet, uh, Paul. Um, okay. To say a couple, a couple of things first. So, um, in the story, in the uh, the Quranic story, uh, the, when Moses was commissioned by Allah Subhanahu wa Taala to go to Pharaoh, he actually tasks him uh, with two objectives. Uh, one of them is to take the Israelites out of Egypt, which is found in the Bible as well. But there's no indication, of course, in the Quran that it was temporary. No, it was permanent leaving Egypt with him to go uh, to the Blessed Land. Uh, the second was, is actually to try and, and convince Pharaoh uh, that he was a messenger from Allah and to uh, become a Muslim, to follow uh, Moses, Moses salam. Uh, of course, when uh, Moses heard um, of the task that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala set for him, he found it quite daunting. Um, he's going to go to this dictatorial uh, monarch and tell him all of that. And each one of them is, you know, is is difficult enough. So um, he asked for support and um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked for Aaron, his brother, uh, to support him. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent them together then uh, to go and to talk to Pharaoh. When they spoke to Pharaoh, of course, he ridiculed them. He did not believe them. He ridiculed the concept of Rabb al-Alameen, the uh, Lord of all peoples or all worlds. Um, he didn't believe they were messengers. Uh, and he then uh, went on. So they told him we want to take um, the Israelites out. And then he went on uh, to make uh, this kind of strange claim. And... Um, So I'm going to read the text in Arabic first, and then the translation will follow uh, for people who can follow in Arabic and would like actually to compare the translation. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. فأتياه فقولا إن رسول ربك فأرسل معنا بني إسرائيل ولا تعذبهم قد جئناك بآيات من ربك والسلام على من اتبع الهدى. Then the text goes on later on. ولقد رأيناه آياتنا كلها فكذب وأبى قال أجئتنا لتخرجنا من أرضنا بسحرك يا موسى. This may be translated as, so go to him and say, we are messengers of your Lord. So send with us the children of Israel and do not torment them. We have come to you with a sign from your Lord and peace be upon he who follows guidance. Then the text um, goes on later to say, we showed him all our signs, but he denied and refused. He said, have you come to us to drive us out of our land with your magic? Oh, Moses. Um, this is uh, this comes uh, from the chapter uh, of um, uh, chapter number twenty. I haven't put the number there. Um, the chapter of Taha, um, and then in the same chapter, actually, it goes on later and says, "Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim." قالوا إن هذان لساحران يريد يريدان أن يخرجكم من أرضكم بسحرهما ويذهب ويذهب بطريقتكم المثلى. They said, these are two magicians who want to drive you out of your land with their magic and do away with your most exemplary way. Uh, 
These are two places um, where this claim is made um, in one chapter. And um, what's interesting um, about it, I think, uh, let me just go back to the um, screen there. Okay. I've highlighted in red the claims. And um, as you can see, uh, in the first one, uh, so the, the, the claim uh, that Moses came to take the Israelites out of um, Israelites out of Egypt is mentioned three times in the Quran, three mm -hmm. times almost in the same wording. From what I recall, maybe identical wording. So three times mentioned. In those three times, there are four responses from Pharaoh or his courtiers, and the four, twice by Pharaoh, twice by his court, the same claim is made in response that Moses or Moses and Aaron had come to drive them, as in the Egyptians, uh, out of their land uh, to give reference to those who might want to follow or check the other uh, references. They are in chapter 26, verse 35. The, that's called the poets. Uh, 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 and then uh, chapter 7, uh, verse 110. That's for uh, anybody who would like to uh, kind of uh, check them, check the other references. Now, when you look at them, when you read these two, there is clearly no connection between them. I mean, he's, he's saying, I want to take the Israelites out of Egypt and leave and leave you alone, do whatever you do in your kingdom. Mm. And then you have this really intriguing, almost bizarre response. And it's not like it's mentioned once. And so we can say, well, or somebody um, who, you know, um, criticizes the Quran would say, well, maybe it was a typo or something wrong with it. No, it's actually repeated four times. Just yeah. in case there's any doubt, the Quran meant every word of it. This strange claim was deliberately and meant it wasn't, you can't claim that it was, you know, someone's writing, etc. Now, if that wasn't, if, if, if this kind of claim wasn't strange enough, it is, is, it's made even more inexplicable when you remember that when mm. Moses took the Israelites out of Egypt, so they escaped, and he decided to chase them, he spoke to his people, and one of the descriptions of the Israelites, according to him, is that uh, uh, those are small, disorganized group or remnants. Well, that makes it even more bizarre. If they are this small, well, what does that mean? How come? And now think of the action itself. If the claim is he doesn't, they are trying to drive him out of his land. Well, what is he doing? He's actually chasing them. So uh, just the whole, the whole thing just doesn't make much sense. And why would he kind of fear, fear them when they are this kind of small, uh, dis, disorganized group? Um, now, the Quran, as we know, in terms of style, is very brief. The mm. text at times can be quite terse. Uh, and then actually you have to work, work a little bit hard at times to try and kind of dig out information. And that's one of the beauties of the beauties of studying the Quran, those subtleties and similarities and dissimilarities, etc. Uh, so there is no straightforward kind of um, um, commentary in the Quran or explanation. All we have is this. Now, we sit today and say, well, this is strange, but it's not only uh, Paul, you and myself that we think this is strange. Exegetes struggled with it. Um, I'm going to review some of the exegetes. So At-Tabari, whom I highly, highly respect and, and love his work because it's the first meta-exegesis where he pulled together 
uh, all the narratives uh, that he could manage about interpretations uh, that uh, were made by a variety of um, Sahaba successors. So uh, what were his dates roughly? When was he? Okay, so, so he died uh, 310. So he was um, first century, late second half, first century, if you like. Um, he died actually in, in Baghdad, uh, not far from, from where I used to live. Um, his death wasn't very nice because he uh, faced a lot of um, hostility towards the end of his life. That's a completely different story. But the point I'm making here is that his, his work is uh, monumental. Uh, what he did, what he produced uh, is, is a quite amazing. And in his work, uh, again, uh, if you look at the four times when this claim is made, mm -hmm. you find him... Um, mentioning just one one interpretation and that interpretation is that G Egyptians considered uh, the Israelite slaves as part of them as a people right so which is why then Pharaoh said well you're trying to drive you out of your land but then think about it Moses did not go there first of all he didn't go there as as a dictator he wasn't talking about I'm going to take people by force mm. out of out of Egypt. He's talking about people who are already suffering, and he was sent uh, to save them, to take them out of him. So if somebody wanted to live in slavery, he wouldn't have gone out of his way to convince them slavery is actually a bad thing for him. He would have left them there. So we are talking here about people who would have wanted um, to go with Moses. So that's one reply. The other is um, when you read the story um, in the Quran, uh, those Israelites uh, were, were, were slaved, uh, slaves. So uh, th there was no indication anywhere that the Egyptians actually treated them as part of them, as part of them as uh, the Egyptian people. They were just slaves. And uh, the Israelites were not the only slaves. I mean, uh, Ramses II, I think, and other pharaohs used to go out looking for slaves. There's one particular campaign to, to Libya, I think, where they brought as many as 3,000 slaves, etc. When they brought them, they did not treat them as, uh, you know, kind of naturalized Egyptians. They did not. Uh, these were slaves and remained slaves. So the opinion offered uh, by um, Tabari doesn't really uh, solve uh, the issue for us. Take another example uh, and another exegete uh, that I highly, highly uh, respect, Fakhreddin al Razi. Oh, Razi. Uh, yeah, sixth, sixth century. Fakhreddin al Razi has written one of the most developed um, uh, exegetical works very detailed analytical yeah. i've got his uh, commentary on surah fatiha uh, behind me and it's a big fat volume uh it's really complex and involved and uh, it's not like reading at all uh but he was clearly a great scholar oh big time and i, I think one of the thing i would say to is just kind of marginal point is actually at times the writing um is so complex at times that he i've seen examples of scholars misreading him gosh as what he said so but he is was encyclopedic hmm. what's interesting about him for our purpose is that he actually in all of this detailed work he makes one uh, passing remark about uh, pharaoh's claim that moses wanted to drive the egyptians out of their land and he all only says uh, well uh, he thought or he claimed that moses was trying to cr create enmity among the people that really doesn't advance as much mm -hmm. enmity between whom mm -hmm. and how would this enmity whatever it is would ultimately realize itself in the egyptian being driven out of their land by moses now the reference point for us every time we think of an interpretation or um, an attempt an interpretation is that moses wanted to leave egypt so every time an, an, an interpretation is offered, let's remind ourselves, is this compatible with the fact that actually Moses was leaving Egypt? It wasn't kind of, I'm staying there. Uh, most of these explanations would make sense only 
it, Moses was lying, so he wasn't actually, he didn't want to go out, uh, leave Egypt, but he wanted to stay there. But of course, that's not the case. So uh, that is no uh, explanation uh, for uh, just create, creating enmity. Another example, uh, uh, this time uh, two centuries later, Ibn Kathir. Ibn Kathir is well known, exegete. Mm -hmm. Ibn Kathir mentions one interpretation in his commentary, and he repeats it four times. In the four instances where the claim is made, he makes uh, the same claim. He says that the verse meant, or the Pharaoh's claim meant, that he was scared that uh, Moses would win a lot more followers than his army and his military capabilities, and that would make him then effectively become more powerful. Being more powerful, he would then drive uh, the Pharaoh and his court out of the land. Again, one problem with that is Egyptians, the Egyptians, uh, the, the Israelites were slaves. They were not equal um, kind of citizens there. And they were actually looked down at like mm. other slaves. The Egyptians were not kind of interested in kind of having uh, equal rights and they would not have wanted to uh, abandon their religion to follow somebody who was preaching a completely different religion that at least partly adopted by some of their slaves. That wouldn't have worked. Um, Moses could not have uh, managed to do that. In fact, there's a verse, I don't have the text here in my notes, that he had actually not, his success with the Israelites themselves wasn't complete. So some people, some Israelites did not actually believe him. So to suggest that he could have kind of converted uh, that many Egyptians to turn the table uh, on Pharaoh just doesn't really fly. It doesn't uh, make sense. Why would they accept Moses uh, as leader? Also, let's say that this is actually what he thought, what Pharaoh thought. Wouldn't you then expect him, if anything, to convince Moses to leave earlier? Not to keep him in the land when he supposedly is going to convert Egyptians into followers and then kick him out. And even if that, so there are just so many objections. Another one, let's say this is what Pharaoh thought was going to happen. You would think he would have said, well, you're trying then to kill me. You're trying to kill me. You're trying to kill me and take over. You're not, he wouldn't have said, oh, you're trying to uh, just throw me out of Egypt. Um, um, when you had wars, um, in, in, in the past, most of the time, when you win a war, you kill your enemy. You don't just simply uh, send them as refugees uh, to neighboring countries. That's not how it works. And again, all these interpretations, every time you uh, kind of contrast them with what Moses was trying to do, which is to leave Egypt, suddenly you see the weakness there. It just is not compatible. So that was the 8th century. Uh, and then I'm going to give one last example. Uh, another fantastic exegete called Ibn Ashur is Tunisian. Uh, he's uh, relatively uh, recent. He died in 1973. Uh, he wrote uh, also a highly regarded exegetical work. Uh, Ibn Ashur kind of quotes and cites some of the earlier opinions, but then he add uh, two kind of new opinions, if you like. One of them, that Pharaoh's court included Israelites. So he was talking to them and say, well, Moses is trying to drive you out of your land. But again, the question here is, how many Israelites were in, 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 in his court? First, second, well, we're not talking, Moses was talking about people leaving willingly with him. He was talking, he was not talking about kind of forcing people um, to go out. Then he offered the second opinion um, that um, Ibn Ashur, and he said, actually, Pharaoh 
possibly thought that uh, Moses was going to establish a new kingdom. So when he leaves, establish a new kingdom, and that is where the danger to Pharaoh came from. Mm. Fair enough. That's actually getting close to what we're going to go to uh, ultimately. Um, but the difficulty here is that we're still left with what is the connection between these two? So let's say uh, Moses left and established a new kingdom outside Egypt. Why would this translate into he is trying to drive you out of your land? There's still this gap, kind of the link is still not, uh, not complete. And um, now obviously uh, Ibn Ashur, like I say, is actually more kind of a modern, includes more information in which he at times uh, utilized um, knowledge that we today have that um, our um, really earlier uh, exegetes did not have. So obviously we are in a privileged position here. So we can talk about things they couldn't uh, speak about. These are four examples uh, I gave. Um, and the reason I chose these four is that because they are highly, highly regarded um, and they cover effectively uh, the whole history we're interested in, they are pretty much representative. Now, I can't claim, and I'm not claiming that uh, I have reviewed ex every exegete, but I feel pretty confident that if you go out and pick an, any random uh, exegetical work, you're going to find um, the, the interpretations that fall within the sphere. You're not going to find anything different. Um, um, Zamakhshari didn't even mention the 6th century Mu'tazilite, didn't even say anything about that. Al-Baydawi, 7th century, uh, I think there's one mention. Again, it doesn't deal with the, with the issue itself. So expect uh, this to kind of uh, recur and this theme uh, to be the same. So how do then What's, what's the claimed interpretation uh, for, for this? Now, before I present um, our interpretation, I would like to say a couple of things about these verses. There will be people out there who won't agree with the explanation, interpretation I'm going to present for obvious reasons. You know, people have different opinions about things. That's fine. Some people wouldn't agree uh, because they have some alternative, potentially alternative theory. I don't know what it is. I'm just making general claim here, potentially. But there are people who are going to say, we're not going to accept anything that suggests that the Quran is miraculous. These people exist and in, in, in large numbers. Now, they may not agree with the, the explanation, interpretation I'm going to present, and they may not accept that the Quran is miraculous, they may not accept any of this. However, they what, what they cannot deny <clears throat> is what the Quran is saying here is really, really hard to explain in terms of the you know the followers of the Muhammad wrote the Quran faith. Now, why on earth would the Prophet alayhi salat was salam write something that exegetes centuries after him struggled to understand. Now, he supposedly sat there, worked really hard on writing something to convince those Arabs, those who ever to do this and that. Yet, he comes up with something that everybody would look at and say, what does that exactly mean? Not only that, it actually contradicts what the Bible says. So whatever Jewish tradition was available at his time, um, written or, uh, um, or verbal, uh, they believed in a story similar to what I presented in the Exodus. There was no indication that of this kind of claim made by Pharaoh, let alone uh, mentioned persistently. I put this, these verses in the same category in which I put verses such as what I call the non-crucifixion verse. They are problematic verses for those who think of the Qur'an 
as something that the Prophet Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam wrote in order to achieve certain end because these do not serve any purpose often they backfire in terms of their criteria so the nano crucifixion verse would have you know made everything everybody say well we know he was crucified why do you say that the christians would have been upset uh, the jews would have said well that's completely wrong etc and you have the similar similar situation here so the point i'm making is that even if you disagree with what i'm going to say and you don't mm -hmm. believe the quran is is miraculous or and you think it will it was written by muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam or whoever you have a problem to solve so don't ignore that do something about it right moving on to the interpretation um i think the uh, solution uh, to this riddle uh, lies in information um, that uh, was not available uh, until recently as you mentioned paul in the last one century and a half or so and this is about this information concerns um, incidents uh, history that goes back to about three to four centuries before the time of Moses. So that's before uh, the time of Ramses II. Now, Ramses II, again, I'm arguing here is that he's the uh, Pharaoh of the Exodus. I discussed about this, he discussed it in, in some detail in the previous um, program on the Exodus for people who would like to check it. But that's basically, uh, I'm you know, using this as a starting point here. Because exegetes did not have access to this information, it would have been very difficult for them to explain what the Quran meant. So let's start with the information uh, that we need in order to understand these um, uh, verses in the light of. Ancient uh, Egypt, the history of ancient Egypt is usually uh, divided into kingdoms, um, three of them and intermediate periods, as well as dynasties within each uh, of these. There are some 30 to 33 dynasties, depends on the classification and division. Uh, the dynasty number 15 is used to be, uh, it's called the Hyksos and it belongs to the second intermediate period. This dynasty ruled in the Nile Delta area. This is north of Egypt. We're gonna see, see it uh, shortly uh, on a map. They ruled for about a century between uh, the middle of the 17th century BCE to the middle uh, of the 16th century, between 1650 to uh, 1550. Their capital was in a city called Avaris. Avaris uh, today is an area called in Arabic Tal al-Daba'a or in English Tal al-Daba'a. Again, I'll, um, you'll see it on the screen uh, shortly. One critical point about these people is that they were Semite. Uh, or as they call them also, Asiatics came from Western Asia. So they came mainly from today's Jordan, Palestine, Syria, that area, and uh, uh, ended up in, uh, in the Delta. Um, it was very common for people to migrate uh, towards the Delta. The word Hyksos itself comes from the Greek and it means rulers of foreign land, f foreign land. And that's how they were seen because they were not seen as Egyptians. And that's really the reason, um, as you know, Paul, that uh, the, these were called kings. They were not called um, uh, pharaohs. Now, the Egyptians hated foreigners. They were very happy to enslave them. Mm. but they were not happy to be ruled by foreigners. And obviously at some point, the Delta was controlled by uh, Egyptian pharaohs. Gradually, uh, they uh, lost that control. Now the most, the most oldest, um, earliest um, account we have about the Hyksos 
uh, comes from um, the Hellenistic Egyptian priest Manetho, and uh, uh, who lived about 13th century or so after after the Hyksos, quite old, uh, so after them, uh, late after them. His writings, um, I think the book is called the History of Egypt. Uh, his writings survived mainly uh, in, in quotes uh, through other writers, um, mainly, I think, Josephus, uh, the Jewish Roman historian uh, Josephus. And according to Manetho, he was really very angry at the Hyksos, and he described them as a very savage people uh, who came from uh, the east uh, and then um, ransacked the cities, destroyed the temples, killed people. They were just straightforward, um, savage uh, people. Now, if I go to the slide now, Now, um, is the slide showing, Paul? Yeah, it's crystal clear. It's okay. okay. So what we see here is a map of ancient Egypt, uh, the upper part of ancient Egypt, it's called Lower Egypt, Lower Egypt, because um, the Nile flows uh, south to north, uh, which is why um, upper e north of Egypt is called Lower, and then south of Egypt is called uh, Upper Egypt. And uh, so uh, the... According to Manetho, there was um, an invasion uh, by the Hyksos and they took over the land, destroyed it, etc. And he was um, very um, hostile to them in, in his account. Um, that kind of uh, image about how the Hyksos came into being in the Delta uh, lived for centuries, mainly based on Manetho's account. Uh, and also, uh, uh, Egyptian records that again talked about them in, in you know very aggressive uh, hostile terms and there was also uh, the belief that um, people think that because they had chariots horse driven chariots um, and uh, also um, a new kind of bows because of this kind of weapon weaponry uh, they they then they, they manage uh, to uh, overtake uh, the delta, so that kind of interpretation of an invasion they call the invasion theory uh, lived for centuries. Modern scholarship uh, actually uh, took takes a different um, kind of view. Uh, it is now accepted by the majority that there was more of a gradual infiltration and. Um, I'm going to show that here, that what you have is a migration of Asiatics from Canaan uh, into the Delta. There are a lot of records of people coming seeking food, water in the Delta during times of famine, drought, etc. This actually recorded over centuries. So the uh, uh, scholars now don't do not believe do not share uh, Manetho's account um, they uh, they think that this happened uh, over time uh, because there are records that goes at least as early as the 19th century BCE uh, of uh, Semitic uh, presence in the Delta uh, area in the Delta region uh, so the Hyksos did not just came into being suddenly uh, for an, an invasion to explain um, their uh, taking control of the area. They, they are the 15th um, dynasty. They were the 15th century uh, dynasty. In fact, the 14th century dynasty, which was also based in, in Avaris, and I think you showed the city here. So this is Avaris, um, Tal al -Dab a. Uh, they were also based there. So, so the 14th century, uh, the 14th sorry, din dynasty uh, were only also mainly Asiatics. That's what their names uh, say. So clearly what you have here is a gradual uh, migration uh, that somehow resulted in the decline of Egyptian control over that area over time. 
to the point that the 14th dynasty was mainly uh, its kings were mainly uh, from um, from the east uh, as in non-Egyptians and obviously then the Hyksos uh, took over and also extended their uh, power base but this is this was uh, their capital they stayed there for about a century until they were kicked out around 1550 BCE uh, by uh, the Pharaoh Ahmus I. And, um, and that was the end of the Hyksos. Uh, they were so resented that they, uh, they, are, they, we know of six kings of them. Um, there may, may have been more, but there are lists of six of them and um, those kings are not usually listed in egyptian records as uh, rulers of egypt because they were not considered to be re legitimate uh, rulers um, so you can see how much uh, they were resented and the point about um, this image is to show where the why um, Pharaoh uh, would have been any Pharaoh would have been really concerned about Moses remember in the four instances he accused him of trying to drive people out of Egypt the Egyptians by his magic because he saw how powerful and how influential he can be so what they were concerned about is that if somebody as powerful influential charismatic capable would leave with already a group of of and that's very important semites who are uh, related in some way to the people who were there at least in in terms of origin uh, would actually possibly uh, form some kind of force and come back come back overrun the area and um, we will be they will be then um, kicked out uh, of the delta in the same way um that three three around three centuries earlier happened three to four centuries earlier happened that would have alarmed any pharaoh however ramses ii had even stronger reason to fear what happened what could happen and this is the reason ramses ii moved his capital uh, from Thebes to a new city that he built about two kilometers north of Avaris. It's called Piramsis. It's in an area called Kantir or Kantir uh, today in Egypt. So it is very close to where Avaris was, the city the capital uh, of, of the Hyksos. And that would have made him even more concerned if the uh, Israelites, if Moses, would lead an army and move uh, from the east westward toward the delta. And if he goes to the same area where they used, uh, yeah, they used to exist, um, the exhaust, then obviously that would mean uh, the uh, fall uh, of his rule. That's the capital. That's what P. Ramses uh, was. Now, I'm going to say a couple of things about P. Ramses itself. This is a description written about the capital of Ramses II by a scribe writing to his superior. And this, this is interesting, which is why I kind of uh, picked this particular text, but there are other texts. So it goes, I found in it very, very good condition, a beautiful district without its like. After the pattern of Thebes, it was Re himself who found it, founded it. The residence is a pleasant in life. Its field is full of everything good. It's full of supplies and food every day. Its ponds with fish, with fish and its lakes with birds. Its, its meadows are verdant with the grass. Its banks bear, bear dates 
its melons are abundant on the sands, etc. Its granaries are so full of barley and emma that they come near to the sky. Onions and leeks are for food, food and lettuce of the garden, pomegranates, apples and olives, figs of the orchard. Its ships go out and come back to mooring so that supplies and food are in it every day. This comes from a source called the Ancient Near Eastern Text. And the reason um, I'm showing this here is because, first of all, you can see there's a, a quite a bit of exaggeration there. I mean, yeah, it, it, it was probably a, quite an astounding city, uh, but it looks like it had just about everything one can think of. Um, now, what's interesting about that is that, remember, this is the same area where the Hyksos were and where Joseph lived, because Joseph lived under the rule of the Hyksos. Prophet Joseph alayhi salam asked to be, he wanted to be a keeper of the storehouses and storehouses for grain, for everything. And this is very much what uh, P. Ramses is described here like. Same area, very close to Avaris, uh, where uh, Joseph would have lived. And as you can see, it's talking about stores, actually, where um, food uh, was kept. Now, of course, the reason scholars mainly think P. Ramses was, was kind of... P. Ramses actually was started um, by Seti the I, uh, Ramses II's father, um, and um, uh, and then he, but he, it was Ramses II who moved his capital there and developed it. Um, and then uh, one, one, you know, most scholars think because he wanted um, kind of to be close to Canaan, uh, there were the Hittites there and he conducted quite a few um, battles with them. And he wanted to be clear, uh, close to that area, um, to the east, so he can control it. Now, another potential reason here is that, of course, that is a very ver fertile area. It's, as you can see, it, it's full of riches, and that's known from the days, of course, of somebody uh, like Joseph. Now, is that clear so far? It uh, is, it is. Now, Ramses II, in you of Joseph, Joseph was a VIP in the Hyksos kingdom. Um, and so he would have lived in, in Avaris. In fact, when the Ahmus I drove out the Hyksos out of Egypt, out of the Delta, it is highly likely that that would have triggered the enslavement of the Israelites because the Israelites' forefathers were actually close uh, to the Hyksos. Um, Joseph himself was very, uh, you know, very high ranking, at least uh, official in the court of at least uh, one of those kings. And in fact, this is confirmed in the Quran. So if we go back to the slide, Is it showing, Paul, there? It is, yeah. 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 So this is uh, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about, uh, somebody uh, who uh, he was part of the uh, people of Pharaoh, but he believed in Moses. And this is what he said, uh, but he was obviously concealed his, his faith. And he goes, and, and I'll read it in Arabic first, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, قَالَ رَجُلٌ مُؤْمِنٌ مَنْ آلِ فِرْعَوْنْ يَكْتُمُ إِيمَانَهُ and then it goes on. وَلَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ يُوسُفُ مِنْ قَبْلُ مِنْ قَبْلُ بِالْبَيْنَاتِ فَمَا زِلْتُمْ فِي شَكٍّ مِمَّا جَاءَكُمْ بِحَتَّى إِذَا هَلَكَ قُلْتُمْ لَيَّ بَعْثَ اللَّهُ مِنْ بَعْدِ رَسُولَهُ كَذَلِكَ يُضِلُّ اللَّهُ مَنْ هُوَ مُسْرِفٌ مُرْتَابٌ And that is um, a translation. And a believing man from the people of Pharaoh who concealed his faith said, and then it goes on until he gets to the point, and Joseph had already come to you before with the clear proofs, but you remained in doubt of that which he brought to you until when he died, 
you said never will Allah send a messenger after him now this is a uh, clear evidence that uh, Joseph was known his memory lived and then um, that kind of um, again contradict contradicts the Bible according to the Bible Joseph was completely forgotten about by the time uh, the Pharaoh of, um, of Moses um, was in, in, in power so that that's against uh, the Bible now so how did uh, the survival because we know that the Ahmos the, the first the Egyptians kicked out the the Hyksos out of the Delta well how would his Joseph's memory survive well we know when the Hyksos were thrown out of uh, the Delta uh, they were not not all Semites not all uh, foreigners there were kind of killed or thrown out we know that uh, those nobility whatever these people uh, escaped or were killed etc but a lot of people actually stayed there and were allowed to stay and uh, uh, a lot of them also kind of uh, became part of bought into Egyptian culture themselves obviously the, the Egyptian actually erased uh, any kind of trace um, uh, of uh, of the Hyksos uh, they just didn't didn't like them at all and um, uh, there are a lot of archaeological, uh, a lot of archaeological evidence to say to say that they actually stayed. Um, a lot of people stayed there. Now, let's just recap what I'm mm -hmm. saying quickly. So Moses, uh, Pharaoh uh, was concerned, apprehensive that Moses will go out, take the Israelites out, and then form um, some army there. Mm -hmm and then come back and if he would come back he would come back to that very area because that's where where everything were taking place remember in Ramses, that's the capital uh, of ramses the second so i'm gonna move now to another slide in which i will show a confirmation of the threat i'm talking about بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وأوحينا إلى موسى أن أسر بعبادي إنكم متبعون فأرسل فرعون في المدائن حاشرين إن هؤلاء لشرذمة قليلون وإنهم لنا لغائض وإنا لجميع حاذرون This is an incomplete translation and we inspired to Moses travel by night with my servants indeed you will be pursued then Pharaoh sent, sent into the city's summoners, saying, Those are small, disorganized remnants. They are enraging us, and we are Jam'un Hadirun. Now, I did not translate this because I would like to show a new, different translation understanding. Uh, of these terms and I will explain why. There are two terms here, Jami'un wa Hadirun and Hadirun. Hadirun, there's no issue there, everybody agrees. It means cautious. Hadirun means cautious. The And everybody also agrees that Jami'un means all of us. So this is how it goes. This is what you find in any book of Tafsir. So there's, if you like, consensus on that. Jami'un means all of us. Jami'un, hadirun then means all of us cautious. So the meaning would be, and we are all cautious. Well, cautious, cautious of what? Because they are a small, they're disorganized, group they are called shirdhima earlier so and in arabic this is there's a bit of arabic so please bear with me here the word jami'un would be completely unnecessary because you will say and we are cautious they, you don't need to say jami'un sorry you don't need to say jami'un why jami'un is there let me give an alternative 
explanation. So I am suggesting this is not a correct explanation of this term. And the term, the explanation I have is alliance. And if you go with alliance, you will end up with a different translation. And we are cautious of an alliance. Only with such an interpretation, the word hadirun, cautious, would make sense. Because think about it. So they are a small group, and he decides to go after them. But they are cautious, kind of afraid of them. Well, it doesn't make sense. Jami'un is means in if you check um, Arabic dictionaries, one of its meanings is an army, and it means a gathering. It is derived from the word jama. Now, please bear with me, Paul, and viewers who don't know Arabic, because what I'm presenting here is important for people who know the language and can go and check, and um, you know, whatever I'm going to say here. Jami'un in Arabic is, um, is what we call ismaf'ul, which is in English passive participle. Hadirun is ism fa'il, active participle. This to, 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 to say that both of them refer, and this is not my opinion, by the way, when I say past participle, active participle, this is just grammar, Arabic grammar, straightforward. To say that both of them refer to the, to the, to, to the Egyptians, as in refer to themselves, it just not just doesn't fly. What we're talking about here, on the other hand, is that Pharaoh is saying, these are a smaller group, let's go after them now, kill them, get rid of them, otherwise they will become a bigger group and come back. Now, just to make this point clear, this analysis of the expression hadirun is not, you can't find it in a tafsir book, but I would encourage anybody who knows Arabic, um, knows grammar Arabic very well, to go and check what I'm saying. But I can only, uh, I can even for those who don't know Arabic, just explain to them that the contrast is completely missing here and there's something not right if, um, um, the, if, if there's no, kind of explanation why he, um, Pharaoh, is is cautious, uh, yet at the same time, he goes after them. Why is he cautious when they are a small group? And the answer to this riddle lies in the word jami'un. Now, further, give more information for those who would like to check this further. The word jami'un occurs in the Quran four times. I've discussed just one of these, and there are three other instances. Both of them, the two of them, are in the in surah number 36, Yasin. And the verses are 32 and 53. And the, there's one instance in uh, chapter uh, 54, Al-Qamar, and that is verse 44. In two of these, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about describing those whom he will gather on the day of resurrection. So the word jami'un talks about the gathering of people on the day of resurrection. It does not mean we, all of us, no. It's talking about a gathering. I don't want to dwell further than that on this point because um, it, it just gets more technical. Paul, because this is, I presume you don't know Arabic, is there anything from your perspective on behalf of your viewers that you think I need to elaborate a little bit more, go over it again, uh, clarify more? 
No, I, I think it's just, it is a technical point to do with the Arabic, so I'm not going to to go there really. Um, well, well, if you if you don't mind, we just just carry on. I think, but yeah. you, you, you you made your point. I think. Yeah. Okay, good. Right now, <laughs> so far, uh, I presented a presentation that presumes that P. Ramses, um, sorry, that uh, Ramses the second hmm. was the pharaoh and p ramses obviously was his capital and the land that he was concerned about being driven out of was his capital was, was very close to avarus the hmm. exos that's that's what I, that's the claim i made however there is actually an alternative explanation that would undermine completely what i've just said but let me discuss it so we all know that after Moses left, the Israelites were left uh, wandering for 40 years. Mm. After that, they went into the into Palestine, uh, the blessed land. And they, uh, they actually kind of took control of land there gradually. We don't know the exact details because the Bible is the only source really. Um, but they, they took control, that's understandable. Ramses II had good control of that area so here's an explanation an alternative explanation what he meant is that moses is gonna take those people gonna go out and then he's gonna take those lands that we own in palestine and drive us out of our land mm -hmm. that is an alternative alternative uh, uh, interpretation mm -hmm. the one problem with this is the fact that the 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 way Pharaoh spoke, expressed his claim, was clearly personal. He was talking about their land, where they lived, the the place uh, that that where they all their families etc. He wasn't talking about some land that he occupied uh, or client states that he had in Canaan. It was very personal, very, very uh, clearly. It was about something that where he lived. So somebody might say, "Okay, this is convincing." Some might say, "Well, yeah, not very much." However, I'll give now uh, straight and direct evidence to confirm the interpretation that presented earlier. So let me move to the next slide then. Mm -hmm. Remember that in the previous four instances um, of the claim, um, Pharaoh spoke about the land. So the question now, is it Palestine? Or what I'm suggesting that it is actually his city, Piramsis. In order to clarify this, let me um, quote a couple of verses. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. قالوا أرجه وأخاه وأرسل في المدائن حاشرين يأتوك بكل ساحر عليم. So this is translated as they said, postpone him and his brother and send into the city summoners to bring you every skilled magician. This happened after. Um, Moses went to Pharaoh and he showed his miracles. So what to do about him? Well, um, he decided to call all skilled um, miracles that he can get hold of in any city around, bring them and set up a contest to see if they would be able to defeat what he saw as magic by Moses. Um, as a marginal point, interesting point, that uh, Ramses II's <coughs> fourth son uh, was uh, had the title of the magician. Now, he actually died in the 55th year, regnal year of, of his father. But it's interesting that uh, his fourth son uh, was called uh, the magician. Um, his name was Kamwaset. So, how is this verse going to help us with the identification of the land? Well, what the Quran tells us is that after Moses came, uh, after the contest, the, uh, the magicians failed 
and they saw that um, Moses' staff actually swallowed what they threw in, there and created in terms of magic. So they, they were not obviously taken in or deceived by their own magic, but then suddenly they saw this staff doing something they, they could not explain. So according to the Quran, they actually conceded there and then that Moses must have been indeed sent by Allah, Rabbul Alameen, the Lord of all peoples. And this is what the Quran then goes on to say. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Qalu amanna bi Rabbil Alameen, Rabbi Musa wa Harun. Qala Fir'aun, aamantum bihi qablan adhana lakum. In hadha lamakrum makartumu fil madinati lutukhriju minha ahla fasawfa ta'lamun. So let's look at what Pharaoh did. They said, we have believed in the Lord of the world, the Lord of Moses and Aaron. And Pharaoh said, you believed in him before I gave you permission? Indeed, this is a plot that you plotted in the city to expel its people out of it. But you shall know. The land now is a city. He brought them from different cities. This is uh, an exact replica of the claim he made in four places in the Quran, um, four other places in the Quran, in which the word land is used, but now it is made clearer, and the land he meant was the city. And this city can only be the city where he was living Ramses, where the contest contest took place, and that is actually what he well, he meant when he said that Moses was trying to drive them out of of their uh, land. Okay. Now, this is the interpretation that I think shows that the Quran contains this subtle kind of subtle reference in the Quran to historical information that wasn't known until relatively recently. To, when we do um, interpretation, when we try to explain interpret verses, what we are exercising is ijtihad, of course. Mm. Ijtihad and somebody else might have a different idea. Would like. It's about coming up with an alternative. Hmm. Um, first of all, this is my, what I would suggest to anybody who would like to follow further on this uh, presentation, check for themselves. This is what I would like to suggest. First of all, check as many tafsir as you can, exegetes, old and new. Check what they say. Remind yourself that the claim was about Moses taking the Israelites out of Egypt. Check every interpretation made against contrasted with, with what Moses wanted to to do and see if it makes sense. And then go through this ayat that I compiled here, put together, and then see whether the explanation, interpretation I have presented makes sense or there is an alternative. Mm. Um, as I um, would like to finish by reminding um, our friends who aren't Muslims, that if they don't believe in the Quran or talking about miracles of the Quran, they should also still reflect on why the Quran has these kind of verses that do not seem to serve any purpose. If anything, they could actually be counterproductive to the mission of the Prophet Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam. Well, that's that's extremely interesting, and um, I, I I like your methodology, your patient methodology, where you consult all these tafsirs, these Quranic commentaries, checking right back to, to, to Tabari and, and Rousey, etc., um, to find out what was understood and believed and known about at that time. And then more recently, you discover this extraordinary, as you say, subtlety involving information about ancient Egypt that only became known uh, in recent times. Um, so this, this is extremely uh, interesting. I say it's a very subtle point, but it's interesting when you, when you, when you, like, if you test the Quran, if you like, in this way, it can disclose these, uh, these jewels, if you like, th these uh, amazing facts which weren't known about before so um thank you very much indeed for for sharing this um i hope it's um widely uh, disseminated understood and appreciated for 
um, what it is. Uh, it, it, it's quite extraordinary. So, just, sorry, just about a question about your own personal discovery. Of this well, when we, uh, you uh, you wrote a book, or you co-authored a book. Yeah, <laughs> what, what that, I, I haven't read that book. Did, did this information feature in that, or is there a more yeah. recent? Discovery? So, um, we were in Durham. Mm. One day, I was very sad. I remember walking from where we used to live uh, to the Department of Physics at Durham University, and I was really hurt. I just read an article. Is it the Atlantic? Um, one particular magazine, it was very quite um, <laughs> critical, defamatory about the Quran, about the Prophet and I was really quite pained at the time. And I mm. remember, remember where I was on a particular road, a very long road that takes to the university, the main campus, when the idea of the book occurred to me. Wow. The idea of a book about the Exodus and about uh, Sayyidina Musa and how to compare the, what the Quran says mm. with what the Bible and other sources. Now, I have an interest in history, but I'm not really an archaeologist and mm. area. So I had to do tons of reading at the time, etc. In order to, and then, uh, so that's where, uh, when, it start, when I started writing it, it's not like I had all this in my mind or my wife, we wrote it together. But these kind of, a lot of this developed as a result of working on the material, learning more, analyzing. And I never really stopped believing in the Quran being an extraordinary source of information. Mm. I was thinking of today's presentation when I mentioned earlier the point about Ism al Fa'al, Ism al Maf'ul, active participle, passive participle. This is something that I noticed today, just today. I was thinking about it. I've worked on the on the this term. But anyway, so that was, and I decided, and we wrote a book at the time in 95, I think, came out. It, it, it was called History Testifies to the Infallibility of the Quran. It was a bit difficult uh, to read at time, so we rewrote it kind of a better presentation um, under the title The Mystery of the Exodus. And so it contains that, it contains other, including some of the material that I presented um, right. last time when we spoke about the Exodus. But it was really um, the idea, like I said, very much came from um, an instance where I read something and I left it quite kind of angry, really, and sad. Mm -hmm. uh, like I said, to the point that I'm not really, my memory is not brilliant, but I remember literally where I was when it occurred to me that I think I need to write about this. So that's, that's right. Extraordinary. Well, it's extraordinary how that, that came about. Well, as I say, thank you very much indeed uh, for, for this, a chronic historical miracle. Um, the crown is constantly disclosing these extraordinary uh, facts. So uh, there are many other examples, of course, that you mentioned in previous broadcasts as well. So thank you very much, uh, Louis, for your uh, time. And, thank you for the opportunity, Paul. Uh, I'm sure it'll be uh, much appreciated by the viewers. So until next time, thank you. Thank Salam. you very much.